Welcome back everybody for our latest edition of the Techno Invest Roadshow webinar series where we will hear from and be able to talk to a range of technology companies listed on the ASX. Each presenter will give a 10 minute presentation and then we will look to a five minute Q&A uh, at, at the end of their presentation. For those who do wish to ask questions, you will see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A function which will enable you to give written questions to presenters, which I will then uh, uh, put to them during the course of their presentation. We have three companies presenting this week. Uh, Recky Pharmaceuticals, ASX code RCE, Vection Technologies, ASX code VR1, and Isatana with an awesome ASX code ICE, I-C-E. If you miss part of the webinar, don't stress, they are being recorded and we can share these with you early next week. Now, that's the housekeeping out of the way. So time for me to introduce our first presenter, James Graham from Recky Pharmaceutical. As I said, stock code RCE. James, over to you. Hi, David, good to be with you. Well, thank you for the opportunity of uh, presenting Recky Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we're listed under the ticker code RCE. If we may stick, skip over the next slide, please. The usual disclaimer applies. So what, what is Ricky? Ricky is commercialising a broad spectrum antibiotic or range of anti-infective drugs. Our primary focus is sepsis, septicemia or blood poisoning. Our lead antibiotic candidate works against gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria and their superbug forms but importantly keeps on working with repeated use, which is the failing of existing antibiotics today. We have a qualified infectious disease designation awarded by the US FDA. That designation is a legal status that provides 10 years of market exclusivity post approval. So we're not eating into that time now and it's above and beyond our patent portfolio, which is out for November of 2035. It gives us fast track regulatory review with the FDA. And to my knowledge, that designation, which is for our lead candidate of sepsis, is the only one in the world. Our patented manufacturing, which is here in Sydney's Macquarie Park, which we own, is producing to volume and quality standards ready for our phase one studies that we're entering for our lead indication. And phase two, assuming a approval to start that study for our topical applications, we'll discuss a little further. Next slide. As a capital snapshot, the technology is invented by Dr. Graham Melrose, his former head of Johnson & Johnson Australasia, executive director of the board. I'm in there at number three as I was the founding investor and have invested in every capital round to date. I'm very aligned with our shareholders and invested $150,000 in the last 12 months. Behind a couple of the nominee accounts, we have some institutional investors, both all around the world, locally and, and internationally. Our share price is actually a touch above there at the moment. It's 74 ish cents. We've got a market capital cap of about $100 million. Uh, we've got uh, $4 million or just under $4 million, given that was at the end of the March quarter in physical cash. But our accrued R&D credits, which have been accruing over the financial year, we're at the end of now. I'd anticipate around another $3 million uh, there. So our true cash runway or true cash position at this moment is call it around $6 million. We have no debt, we wholly own our technology, and we're caveat free. So we're moving ahead through an infectious disease crisis that we're in with a fantastic range of infectious disease products. Next slide. So really as a snapshot of what, what our company is about, uh, is our company has a lead indication for sepsis. It's an intravascular application. Sepsis in simple form, as you'll see further in, is basically a, a advanced infection. It starts as a preliminary, say a UTI infection, and when it goes untreated or doesn't respond to antibiotics, it get, means the bacteria spreads through the body very, very quickly. Our secondary indication is topical administration or topical dosing. So one's needle, which is IV, the other you put on the skin surface, typically through a spray bottle. Uh, that is um, tackling skin infections, burns wound infections, and assisting in wound closure or wound healing. Both of those have pre finished the preclinical studies. Both of those have a clinical program starting in the second, or anticipated to start in the second half of this calendar year. 
which we're rapidly moving into at this moment. Separate to that, we have um, uh, expanded our antiviral focus as a new class of antibiotic technology or really anti-infective technology, we have great capability with our universal mechanism of action to tackle viruses. And given the COVID crisis globally, that's an area I think there'll be continued focus on in the time ahead. And as a technology, we have indication in other areas. H. pylori is an old formula, which is Helicobacter pylori, 50% of, uh, well, they say the world's population. I really think Asia's population has that bacteria and of course gonorrhea as well. Next slide. Why are we different and why are we unique? All antibiotics to date are natural. They're bacteria or they're fungi. And, and when you have a bacterial fungi, you basically take that from the deepest of caves, darkest of oceans, and you cultivate that out. It creates an antibiotic. You then use that antibiotic against the offending bacteria. And the problem you have is they have a prior relationship to each other and they work much like a, a lock and a key. When that bacteria mutates, that lock and key no longer works. You're as good as what's given to you in nature. We've designed ours with first principles in mind, or really Dr. Melrose, former head of Johnson & Johnson did, or has. And uh, what that means is, beginning with the end in mind, we designed our universal mechanism of action not to succumb to bacterial mutation, we don't want a lock and a key fit because those bacteria will always have always mutated and always will. We're attracted to the proteinaceous layer of the bacteria themselves and we interact with the unique internal cellular pressure of the bacteria themselves. And that means we're not reliant on what's given to us in nature, which includes, of course, the negative side effects that come with the, um, the fungi or bacteria provided. We have a synthetic process that manufactures it very economically, and it means that we have a unique capability that nature simply can't provide. Next slide. Our lead focus, of course, is sepsis. We talked about it as that as um, our primary indication. It's an enormous unmet medical need. It's the most expensive condition treated in health, double the second most expensive. And there's around 50 million people worldwide every year that get sepsis. Well, there's an unmet medical need. One in five, one in three people who get sepsis die, and typically within the first 24 hours. The reason they do is, of course, there's no drug therapy specifically approved for sepsis. What they do, and I've been a sepsis patient, when you present to a, to a hospital, they go, okay, this patient has a fever, they're showing indications of sepsis. We don't know what type of bacteria that patient has. It's guesswork. So they do a, a diagnostic blood draw, they race it to the pathology, they cultivate it out, they seek what type of bacteria it is, and then they work out with that bacteria, what antibiotic do we use and what is it susceptible to? Time, time is killer. Now we've designed ours that any, well firstly any bacteria in the blood is bad bacteria. So as a first in line therapy to intravenously be in fused to the patient to get on top of that bacterial problem at patient presentation seeks to eliminate that guesswork. If that patient has no matter the type of bacteria, E. coli, staph, pseudomonas, aeruginosa or a superbug, we want to get on top of that infection at first patient presentation and that we have able, been able to do in small and large species and importantly repeatedly to date. We'll go to the next slide and I'll really start to kind of speed up recognising obviously the time. Um, this is our first human clinic, formal human clinical trial, I should say. We've had a little bit of special access game activity in the background. This trial is assessing safety. They're healthy people, they're you and me, uh, 40 healthy individuals. It's in a specialist uh, clinical trial facility in Australia. Uh, we anticipate first human dosing in the second half of the calendar year, which we're rapidly coming around to at this moment. And that is really seeing how much of the product intravascularly humans can take. And we've got a good indication of that in animals. You'll see further in there, we've had some self-dosing of a leading clinician in New South Wales. He did that because, you know, he tells a wonderful story of the drugs of old. He used to give a patient one antibiotic, say, take that, you'll get better. Now he has to give many follow-on repeats to get the same result. And that's bacteria mutating and drugs no longer working. So he's there for the support of his patients. And I'd anticipate there'd be clinic, clinical data related to this in the second half of this coming calendar year, or financial year, calendar year. Second half of the calendar year, <laughs> next slide. This is a snapshot of our prevent, curative and preventative. 
Obviously, uh, we, we refer to um, MRSA, which is a drug resistant staph. 10 out of 10 with recce survived, nine out of 10 with oxacillin. Well, obviously that's 100 in every thousand patients, not so good. The reason we chose oxacillin is oxacillin is the best antibiotic for staph. Now in a clinical setting, it could have been E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, hundreds of different types of bacteria. Oxacillin does not work against those other types of bacteria. So the guesswork and instead the cocktail of drugs the clinicians would have provided may well have not had such a positive indication, but we still outperformed it. Preventative, uh, that is seeking to prevent infections ever taking place. Keeping it simple, you've got one group of animals that had recce protecting it from infection, the other group did not. That fall in bacterial decline is because the bacteria moves from the blood to culminate in the kidneys, which is organ failure and death. We've got no infection, you've got no problem, and that's typically post-operative, which this is focused on or in that preventative landscape. Next slide. This is a, a quick example of um, some of our safety work that we've done. This is in rats. Uh, so you do small species and then you do it again in large species, we'll see in a moment. Really, you look at different dose categories and I'll just keep it simple that we, by example, for 4,000 milligrams per kg, you give it one day to the same animal with the same concentration or animals, I should say, those dots represent little rats. <laughs> and you do it every single day repeatedly. You monitor them, obviously, visually. What are they eating? What are their weights? And then after you do an autopsy and assess, or with blood draws, of course, and assess their, their function. Point being, there's a big gap between our therapeutic dose, which is very low, about 50 to 100 megs per kg, and where you'd start to see toxicity, which is very, very high. Beautiful window, good sign of an antibiotic. Next slide. This is uh, where we repeated it in dogs. Dogs are a lot more sensitive. Um, we still had an outstanding safety window there and you can look at that at your leisure. Next slide. Now this, I, I get quite excited about this because of course a, a UTI infection when untreated becomes septic. Well, what if we can be that drug that both treats the UTI infection at first patient presentation, but also complement if it is moving into the septic stage. So this is starting to try to lock up that anti-infective mold of when a patient presents with a UTI infection, a kidney infection, or potentially an other, other infection, but these are the two here now, uh, that we have efficacy that will get on top of that infection and look after that patient, getting them out of the hospital as quickly as possible. Next slide. Efficacy and wound healing. I love this one because I think we've all had infections in one form or another. I love fishing. I've had a lot of skin infections. This is assessing our compound in reducing burn wound infections. Burn wounds in Australia, we have a wonderful capability in that area uh, amongst some clinicians. And this is currently before a hospital's uh, human ethics committee for a study in a burns ward. Um, this basically shows that in wound healing, or I should say in reducing wound infection on these rat burns with MRSA, we significantly outperformed uh, the best uh, in class. That's using theirs at the optimum therapeutic dose. We used ours at an experimental dose. I think we can do even better again. And wound healing is on the other side there. So we've got an open wound, say a surgery, and you get a bacterial burden around the outside of that wound. The wound no longer closes. The longer it's opened, the other foreign matter and complications that can occur, you want to assist that wound in wound closure. So the two, I believe that'll be part of anticipated clinical trial coming up. Coming up. Next slide. Now, this is a fun area. Here is viruses. Uh, we chose influenza virus recently because influenza has a RNA profile very similar to coronavirus. It's very, very difficult to get access, testing access, to coronavirus. So what we see here is actually when testing on influenza at day four, we had a BLOQ, below limit of quantification. We had a cure in these lucky little animals. And that, that lung infection, that in, influenza infection is actually a respiratory infection. So with this wonderful data and capability against the viral cells, which is because of the protein envelope in, is very, very similar to the bacterial cells, and I won't get too deep on the technology side there, we believe that this could be part of the therapeutic um, opportunity to, to be part of the coronavirus story. I'm not claiming we've worked on coronavirus, but I am saying it could be part of that story in the time ahead. And we're rapidly moving to further assess this consistent with that. 
when you've got quickly mutating viruses as quickly mutating bacteria, you've got a technology with a unique mechanism of action to interact regardless of its mutation. Next slide. Keeping it simple, this, this is the five deadliest bacteria by World Health. We kill the standard forms and the superbug forms in the same time with the same concentration. It's all just bacteria to us. We don't care lipid adelaides or biofilms. Next slide. Importantly, do we work with repeated use? The commercial antibiotic is amoxicillin, sells at about 10 billion US per annum. Will they stop working after repeat cycles against these three deadly bacteria? We work as well the first time, at least every time through the 25th time, that was for patent purposes, granted around the world. Um, we've done that hundreds of times informally and we've never failed to kill and with repeated use as this demonstrates. Next slide. This is just a quick snapshot working visually. That's a buoyant E. coli uh, cell. If we go to the next slide, you can see after 20 minutes of exposure, that bacteria has burst. Well, that's a good thing. You don't want the bacteria to be viable. Next slide. No more bacteria, no more problem. Next slide. Our patents, composition of matter out to, um, which is both uh, curative claims and manufacturing claims, November 2028-29. Manufact uh, sorry, preventative uh, and dosing formulations. So IV, oral, topical, nasal, inhaler, claims out to November 2035. Next slide. This is our manufacturing. Those bottles are on their way to, to hospitals at this moment. It's inexpensive. We get a very high yield. The liquid costs more than the bottle. Sorry, yeah, the bottle costs more than the liquid that goes in it. We make it to uh, both volume and quality standards ready for our phase one, phase two studies. Next slide. And really, we're an infectious disease company in the midst of a global infectious disease crisis. We have good, a good cash position. We have warm tailwinds with the, the, eco the economic crisis that infectious diseases represent and a unique class of antibiotic technology or technology applicable to the global health problem. We're moving ahead and we believe there'll be significant news flow in the near term and we thank you for your interest. James, great presentation. We do have a little bit of time for a couple of questions. So um, I'll put them to you as presented and some of them may seem obvious. Um, <laughs> the, the increase or the sharp increase in share price recently, do you put that down to uh, the influenza, influenza work that you're doing um, and people just seeing an obvious COVID-19 link? I think it's a plethora of factors. I wouldn't see it as that simplistic, although that is an, e an easy and appropriate um, contributor. Uh, we, we've announced recently a number of significant data points in a range of indications and influenza was one of them. I think when people start to look at the macroeconomic effect of an infectious disease such as coronavirus or the potentially antibiotic apocalypse that we're coming to with superbugs, you start to recognise the importance of new medicine and new technology. And uh, I've, I've noticed particularly through the share registry, the interest comes from all over the world. Um, I'd actually say the other areas outside of Australia are really feeling the pain and need of new medicine. And, you know, with potentially the first new class of antibiotic or, or drug in over 30 years to tackle these spaces, it's a very good time to be in infectious diseases. And in terms of uh, the clinical trials, what, what is the timeline of those for investors? Yeah, so uh, the phase one human uh, IV trial, the phase one IV trial, uh, we've announced we anticipate first in human IV dosing in the second half of this calendar year, uh, which we're rapidly coming into at this moment. I, I can't be more specific there. But for a cost purpose of that trial, it costs about $1.3 million. It's not expensive. It's very simplistic assessing a, a, a compound in this space. From the perspective of the topical study itself, um, it is before an ethics committee at this moment. Uh, it, if, if approved, it would be their hospital, their patients, their clinicians, our product, very inexpensive. I'd say, I, I really do see that it would be a clinical data point or multiple data points in the same time in parallel to that IV um, sepsis trial. The other indications and what they could be during that time is still to, to be determined. Well, James, we do have some other questions, but I might try and take those offline and we'll answer those uh, in, in a written form uh, for the attendees. But that was a great presentation, James. Well funded, exciting times ahead. Thanks for your time. Thanks, David.
We now move on to our next presenter, Jan Marco from Vection Technologies, AX code, ASX code, apologies, VR1. Jan Marco, look forward to the presentation. Over to you. Thank you. Hi, David. Thanks for having us today. Uh, next slide, please. Usual disclaimer, next slide, please. So my name is Gianmarco Rignoni and I'm a director and COO of Vection Technologies Limited. Please, next slide. Next slide. So what is Vection Technologies? Vection Technologies is a multinational software company and we specialize in emerging technologies such as real-time software technologies that enable the digital transformation of industrial companies worldwide. And we do this with our 3D virtual reality and augmented reality technologies and the convergence between these technologies and industrial Internet of Things, IoT, and computer design, so CAD. And we do this addressing multiple workflows within companies, industrial companies and manufacturing companies. We go from design and engineering to manufacturing, training, marketing and sales, and also to maintenance. Please, next slide. So our technologies have a very wide range of applicability across industries. So in the case of architecture, engineering and construction, one of our key partners and key clients is the global contemporary architecture firm in London, Zaha Hadid, and they use our mindless software on their day-to-day -day design workflows to visualize in real time how their design in the computer-aided software looks like in virtual reality. And in virtual reality, they can also edit the same design. So that means we are eliminating the need of exporting and re-importing uh, 3D models from your CAD software to the virtual reality environment. In the machinery manufacturing space, we've got a, a very big uh, portfolio of clients, but one of our key clients and soon to be partners is Quasia. So Quasia is a multi-billion dollar company that specializes in packaging uh, machinery. And with them, we've partnered with Quasia to develop uh, the first of its kind for this specific industry solution that addresses in augmented reality, uh, the maintenance uh, services on the machinery. So clients, Quasia's clients worldwide can jump on on the tablet and visualize step by step what are the necessary procedures to undertake to maintain uh, and fix uh, event potential problems in the machinery. Another key cluster, as we like to call it, uh, um, of um, industry that we target is the automotive industry. So in the automotive industry, we've got a wider range of clients. Again, we've got Lamborghini, we've got Volvo, uh, we've got Maserati, and lately we've also um, started working with, uh, uh, with Volkswagen, and we just attended a very significant and exclusive event for Volkswagen in Germany uh, just last month. In the case of Lamborghini, for instance, they use a frame as software, and they use it to completely eliminate the requirement of early prototyping in their workflow. So that means that instead of having to wait months and visualize and see in a real prototype of a new vehicle that can just jump, jump on in a matter of seconds into virtual reality and see in high quality and high definition the 3D model of the new vehicle. So chances are the new Lamborghini that have, that have come out in the last few years have been developed also through the use of our frame as software. Another key industry is the naval industry. So uh, We've got a number of clients such as uh, uh, Azimut or Ferretti Group. So Ferretti Group uh, is one of our key and historical clients. We've been working with them for years now. And Ferretti, they are using a frame as software as well. And they, and they manufacture luxury yachts. So imagine in a sales workflow scenario, when they are talking to a potential client or a signed on client as well, they can jump on frame S and in virtual reality, they can visualize and edit the interior design of their yacht, of their luxury yacht, or collaboratively through the cloud. In the fashion and furniture, obviously, we, as you can notice from my accent, we're Italian, so we love our fashion and our furniture. We've got a very uh, big list of clients. One of our key clients is Fendi Home. So Fendi Home, we developed a very specific solution for them. So for them, uh, we were able to develop through our technology a software that enabled them to connect directly uh, with, uh, with their clients and visualize the pieces of furniture in augmented reality and also seeing them in the space. So imagine just a tablet, you can just click on your new couch, for instance, and you can see it in the space. The education industry, we've started working and focusing on this industry late uh, 2019, and we just uh, uh, 
signed an, a, a partnership with uh, one of the key uh, motor vehicle universities worldwide, which is the Mooner. So Mooner uh, combines companies such as Ferrari, such as Dallara, uh, Red Bull in Formula One, with uh, all the biggest universities that uh, um, train, say, engineers in the automotive space. And with them, last, just last week, actually, we did the first live class in virtual reality through our software. And another key industry that we have focused in the last couple of months has been the healthcare industry. Uh, and we've also been able to uh, commence a collaboration with CGM, so Compute Group Medical, which is one of the biggest e-health companies worldwide uh, listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. And with them, we're working on two key clusters, so the dental space, so for the dentist industry, and also in the pharmacy world, so developing together with CGM solutions that integrate the ERP system into augmented reality. Next slide, please. And we've been able to do this well, through our very significant partner portfolio. So in the software space, we've partnered with all the key computer-aided design software developers worldwide, such as the Soul Solid Works, the French-American company, McNeil and Associates, who are the developers of the Rhinoceros and Grasshopper software, which is very widespread also here in Australia, in uh, over East, uh, for the naval uh, manufacturing design processes. Also with Autodesk, Intel, Epic Games, and one of our latest ones has been Siemens. So with Siemens today, we're working with them to integrate our Mindless software with the Siemens NX software, so the CAD software. And together with them, we're now going out to their clients to identify the first use cases of this integration. In the hardware space, so we've partnered with the key manufacturers of virtual reality headsets. One of these is HTC Vive. So HTC is the Taiwan, Taiwanese innovator listed in, in Taiwan, obviously. And you probably all know, it, know them because they also manufacture phones. Uh, HTC, they also are our shareholders as well. So they're in our uh, shareholder base. Uh, another key partnership in the hardware space is Logitech. So with Logitech, we're actually proud to say that we were among the first software to be integrated into the VR Ink Pen which is the first product of its kind. So it's a pen that enables you to design with precision in virtual reality. And then we're going to the financial side. So our institutional shareholders, as we like to call them. So uh, we call them our partners as well because we've got very cl close relationships with them. So as I mentioned, we've got HTC, but we also have one of our substantial shareholders is CDP, CDP Ventures, which is the innovation fund of the Italian government. Plus, we've got a number of European funds as well. Next slide, please. So we've been able to grow in the last uh, 24 months, mainly through a global reach. So we've got an office, a small commercial office in ISX headquarters here in Perth, and we just recently commenced uh, a commercialization uh, roadmap here in Australia. We've got our backbone of development uh, in India. We've got two offices uh, in Europe, an R&D office and a commercial office. Plus, we've got a, a small office that we've now commenced growing in San Francisco in the US. And all of this is done through a partner, a partner network of 40 plus partners worldwide. And we're growing every week. Next slide, please. As I may have mentioned during the presentation, we've we've focused substantially on a growth process. So we've been able uh, since uh, early 2018, so in the first half of 2018, to grow revenue from $200,000 in the first half of FY18 to $2 million in the first half of FY20. We've got 1.5 million cash up bank. Uh, we've also been able to post a small EBITDA in the first half of FY20. And we also have got access to what we call, like to call smart capital initiatives. So we've just been able to close a 300 grand R&D grant over in Europe. Uh, we've just closed a $3.2 million grant from the European Union as part of a consortium, which aims to develop a new virtual reality uh, software based on a minded software uh, that enables the integration with CAD uh, computer aided design, computer engineering, and also with BIM software. Um, and all the IP that's going to be developed through this process is going to be 100% retained by Vection Technologies. Next slide, please. So we've identified three key building blocks 
to achieve what we like to call a market dominance in the emerging technology space. So we've got a very significant focus on the development of technology, as you may have noticed during this presentation, through also a very close relationship with our partners and also through uh, what we like to call the growth uh, building block, which means accessing clients that are the end users of our software. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thanks. For the pur purpose of this presentation, we have identified one key industry that we're working in, which is the industry 4.0 industry, which means the digitalization of the manufacturing processes of industrial companies' uh, workflows. So in this sector, you can see that McKinsey has estimated 70% of manufacturing companies still haven't adopted the full potential of digitalization. So this is the real opportunity for us. So we're just at the cusp of what is a new industrial revolution. So companies are gonna increasingly adopt adopt a kind of real-time technologies, enable to become more efficient and also to sell more. Next slide, please. So again, one of the key items or key workflows that we're addressing today is the design and simulation uh, workflow. So when new products, uh, also your computer, your phones, uh, or anything in your home is designed, gets designed through a CAD software. So it means on a 2D screen, even if it's visualized in 3D, but it's always on a 2D screen. So in order for this process to become more efficient and to eliminate uh, the requirements from re-engineering and remanufacturing and redesign, we enable our clients to jump from CAD software to virtual reality through a bi-directional live link. So that means you can edit the same 3D model or the same project, let's say, on either platform in real time and also collaboratively. So I could be working on the CAD software on my computer and another gentleman could be working in the same project in virtual reality. So also cutting cost of design. Next slide, please. Here, I don't know if the video will work on Zoom, but here we can see our FrameS, or at least a snapshot of our FrameS software. So our FrameS software enables uh, increased, um, increased presentation. So you are enabled through a, a virtual reality environment to visualize your 3D model in high quality. You can edit the 3D model in the virtual environment space. You can showcase the same 3D model through the cloud to people worldwide in the same environment. You can talk to them and also you can change the surroundings. So it creates uh, even uh, more uh, efficient presentations. Next slide, please. Here again, you can just see a snapshot here, uh, but you can see on our YouTube uh, uh, YouTube channel, you can see more videos if, if you'd like. So here you can see our Minded software. So here you can actually see on the right, you can see the CAD software and on the left, you can see the virtual reality software. And if the video <laughs> worked, in this case it doesn't, you could actually see that in the virtual environment software uh, environment, you are editing in real time the 3D model of this boat and you're visualizing it and everything gets translated. Uh, all the geometries get translated in the CAD software. Next slide, please. Again, this was a video, but this was a very significant use case for us. So this was a company uh, out in San Francisco who used our Minder software and the integration with SolidWorks, which is one of the most widespread CAD softwares globally. And they've used our software both for the engineering stage, but also for the presentation of this wastewater treatment plant, a very innovative process. And they've been presenting this solution, so this wastewater treatment plant, in virtual reality through 2D Californian government. Next slide, please. So in terms of the market size and the opportunity, I like to focus more on the number of users. So if we focus mainly on the engineering side, we can see that 9 million potential engineers and drafters uh, are the market today for us. In addition to 19 million potential analysts, engineers, engineers, and people that work on the plant or in the industrial floor. Next slide, please. Next slide. So here you can see just a brief corporate overview, corporate snapshot of, of our company. So uh, right now we've got a market cap of 26 million. We've got over 1.5 million cash up bank. The interesting component of, of our shareholder base is that board and management owns 40% of the company and we've got a 16% institutional investor 
shareholder base. So the same people that I was, or companies, entities that I was mentioning earlier. So HTC Vive, the Italian government, uh, and a number of European funds as well. So the top 20 owns around 20%, and we've got then the free float or other shareholders that uh, represent circa 25% of the company. Next slide, please. In terms of the highlights or wrapping up this presentation, so one key element that I always like to focus on has been the ability to execute of management. So since uh, we, have, we have embarked on this uh, real-time technology journey, we've been able to continuously deliver on, uh, on a strategy. And you can see that from, from, our, from our announcements. It's very, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of announcements there because we've been working in a significant way to achieve our milestones. Uh, obviously, we've been assisted with the market trends in the general market. So um, the industry 4.0 uh, framework is also incentivized by government worldwide. So this is also creating a push uh, in the, in the uh, adoption of our technologies. And we've been able to do this with very significant technology partnerships, such as the Soul Systems, SolidWorks, Siemens, Epic Games, and so on and so forth. And also now with the Italian government and HTC Vive as shareholders, we're also in a better position to achieve, achieve our goals in the short term. Next slide, please. Next slide. Dave, over to you. Thanks, Gianmarco. A great presentation. A couple of questions uh, from me and those from um, people who have submitted questions. COVID-19, work remotely, um, technology advancements. Are you seeing a, an upswing in interest off the back of people understanding that working remotely may become part of the new working norm um, and therefore that ability to collaborate across various jurisdictions and locations um, is something that, that now has greater appeal? 100% yes. The, the quick answer is yes. The long answer is we've uh, received the inbound inquiries from, from a number of of companies worldwide. The latest one that I can just think on about on top of my head is a company that manufactures soles for, for shoes without saying any names. Uh, and they were interested in finding new solutions all through the cloud or in virtual environment, in a virtual environment, in virtual reality to be able to sell more. So to create essentially Shopify, the virtual reality uh, experience for their clients. And in terms of your actual touching on that, your sales distribution strategy, how, did, how does that roll out? We've got a direct sales team uh, over in Europe and we're now growing uh, the one over in the US. And the rest of the world is mainly distributors, resellers and business developers as we like to call them. And in terms of competitors, is this a competitive market or do you have an, a genuine IP advantage here? Uh, it's a competitive um, market in terms there's a lot of companies, uh, uh, small scale companies. Uh, so it's very fragmented as a market, uh, but we've got a, a very specific technology advantage because we provide a live link between CAD and virtual reality. And today no one has been able to achieve that multi-CAD virtual reality solution on the market today. Gian Marco, a great presentation. And as you say, Thank Victor, you, it's been exceptionally busy in recent months. <laughs> Uh, and uh, long for investors' sake, long may it continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. Cheers. We now move to our last presenter of the day, Matt McFarlane from Isatana, ASX code ICE. Matt, over to you. Okay, great. Thanks very much for having me along. And um, it's really great to be here. Maybe we could go to the next slide. Uh, the regulatory background, we'll skip over this like the others did. Uh, so a quick introduction to Isotana, we're an AI-driven video analytics company. So we don't build surveillance cameras, we don't build hardware, what we build is the software that analyzes video streams and footage, and I'll take you through the details of that. Our principal offering to our customers is that we allow video surveillance networks to be actively monitored and become real-time response operations rather than largely recorded footage. And I'll, I'll walk through that in the presentation. Next slide, please. So, oh, this has come up very dark. So we have over 12,000 cameras utilizing Isotana globally. That's in, in uh, a market that is literally in the hundreds of millions of cameras uh, at 38 customer sites worldwide. The business has been around for 10 years, although we listed on the stock exchange just prior to Christmas uh, last year and raised $5 million in that capital raising. We have patents over our um, major 
technology platform that we operate with and we have an excellent management team. I'll take you through some details of that as we get into it. Uh, and I'll also talk a bit more about the global video analytics market, which is growing very rapidly and is a very large space. So um, that's pretty exciting. Next slide, please. So what Isotana does is that um, the software uses AI technology to understand movement patterns in front of a fixed field view camera. So if you have a large surveillance network, which is you know, providing security surveillance over an area, let's say it's a university or something similar, our software plugs into every individual camera and it spends two weeks learning the movement patterns that are happening in front of that camera. And after that two week period, it starts to identify anomalies or unusual movement patterns in real time. And it throws these movement patterns up into the control rooms of the security monitoring centers, which oversee all these surveillance networks so that the security operators and the guards can respond much more rapidly to um, uh, unfolding events as they happen. Uh, I'll take you through a little bit more about the technology in just a moment, but that gives you a broad overview of what Isotana software does uh, for our clients. Next slide, please. So here I'm gonna just talk through it. This is a typical scene at a university campus. You can see students walking around, although it's not a very typical scene during COVID-19 uh, at university campuses anyway. And what the software does is it learns that there is a movement of pixels going on where the walkways are, or perhaps where the leaves are blowing in the wind. Uh, and it understands whereabouts within the scene the movement is happening, uh, which direction that the pixels are traveling in, the density of those pixels, you know, in terms of how much of the screen they're taking up. And let's say that a person was to jump into the garden at the bottom right of this scene, it would immediately pick up that that's unusual and anomalous movement. Or if somebody was to drive a food truck through here um, and you know going to set up to, to sell hot dogs to the students, it would pick that up as a large bulk of pixels moving where it's typically expecting pixels that are more of the shape and size of human beings. Now our software doesn't identify or differentiate between humans, dogs and cats, leaves blowing in the breeze or, or tanks or cars driving in front of the camera. Um, all it does is it analyzes pixels, which is really good from a security perspective because uh, there's a lot of privacy concerns um, about facial recognition technology and people being identified or targeted by human AI trained systems. And Isotana doesn't do that at all. So from the perspective of um, the privacy concerns which are dogging this uh, surveillance industry, Isotana is in a very, very good place. A great way to very much simplify what Isotana does is it's like movement detection on steroids. With a typical surveillance network, you have movement detection which results in approximately 40% of surveilled time not having to be recorded because 40% of the time there is no movement in front of the cameras uh, and the other 60% of the time there's some kind of movement. But that movement might just be leaves blowing in the breeze, which you can see at the top left of this scene. Um, what the software is doing is it's learning all of the movements that are typical in front of the camera and it's doing it by time of day. So it knows the difference between one o'clock in the morning when there shouldn't be anyone on this uh, walkway uh, versus 10 o'clock in the morning when there might be people walking between different lectures. And having gone through that learning process, it can start to report those anomalies. So our form of movement detection actually only reports 1% of surveillance time rather than 60%. That means 99% of what takes place in front of the cameras can be ignored by the operators because they only need to focus on the unusual and interesting things that are happening. Now, let me take you through a bit more about that. So next slide, please. When we, um, when we pick up an anomaly, we throw it up on a, on a screen similar to this. So this gives you an idea of how Isotana's user interface works. It's what we call a black screen interface where the operator doesn't have to look at anything unless something unusual starts to happen. Here are a few examples. It's, it's a, a mock-up, so it's slightly more exciting than what you might see in a typical Isotana installation. But things like uh, fights breaking out, cars driving where they shouldn't be going, maintenance crews doing activities. These are all interesting things for con control room staff to take, it, um, take note of. And they may require a response, or they may simply ignore them, in which case the event will fade away just as it does with uh, normal motion detection. So our system is really about drawing the attention of the operators to potential events of interest. Next slide, please. Uh, what is the, the main um, uh, problem that we're solving with Isotana? The main problem is that the vast bulk of surveillance networks that, that are out there are only used for recording. So it's like a giant VCR recorder. It, it tells you what's happened, but it only tells you looking backwards into the past. And whilst these systems are 
uh, being increasingly improved and there's new technologies coming along, our, our approach using pixel movement is far more efficient than many of our prospective competitors. We also use a very different approach to our prospective competitors in that we train by each individual camera what's going on so that we can report unusual things based on a camera view rather than some kind of a rule. And a typical rule might be facial recognition, which says, if you find this face from this database, give me an alert, or uh, a virtual tripwire, which says, if somebody's moving across the top of this fence line, give me an alert. That takes a lot of time to set up, and it's very processor intensive, which makes it expensive. Next slide, please. So uh, some of our competitors include people like Briefcam and Clearview AI, who do facial recognition technology. And um, those competitors, as I said, very processor intensive. The big difference with Isotana is that we can be applied across all the cameras in a network and start to immediately report improvements and, and um, uh, better performance. Next slide, please. Oh my goodness, these slides have been converted into nasty colors. But anyway, um, the global video analytics market is a very fast growing market. It's growing at 20% per annum plus. Uh, and it's a multi-billion US dollar market. So within a few years, we're talking about a 12 billion Australian dollar market. So it's a very interesting market. One of the reasons I'm most, um, I'm most excited to be getting into it. Please go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of our offering to customers, um, I'm sorry about the format of this, but what we do pick up is unauthorized access, irregular movements, uh, fights breaking out, um, uh, suspicious behavior, medical events like people tripping over and requiring support or uh, assistance, uh, uh, camera tampering and vandalism. And we get great outcomes for our clients. And I'll talk about um, our different clients and, and how sticky they've been in terms of implementing us uh, in a couple of slides time. But the best verticals where we've had the most success to date have been on uh, the retail space. So looking at retail shopping centers, university campuses, um, and other security verticals, which include most recently, we've started to crack into the prisons market with our first prison client signed, uh, and also with um, police and public uh, security and safety, which is very important in the COVID space. Because when you have uh, empty areas, because people are staying home or not coming to the university, you have um, a lot of potential for soft targets in terms of uh, asset protection. And when people come loitering onto uh, university campuses that are largely empty, uh, security guards like to know about that sort of thing. And so Isotana, as a self-training system, and I mentioned this two weeks learning period, it actually continues to learn every single day. So even when the campus gets quieter, within a week or so, the system has adjusted to understand that, okay, it's a much quieter campus. I'll start reporting anybody wandering around at various times of the day. Next slide, please. Uh, we have been growing very nicely in the, uh, throughout the period leading up to COVID. COVID, of course, has hit us like it has many others from a customer sentiment perspective. It's, it's hard to get purchase orders out of people when they're very nervous about the future. Uh, but we've continued with our customer implementation growth. And although you probably can't see these numbers, they kind of go from 15, 16, uh, 21 to 27. I'm never going to let anyone do presentations on their slide deck instead of mine in future. Um, but we're growing very rapidly. And live implementations means, you know, we might get a purchase order from a customer uh, two or three months ago. We then have to secure the hardware, organize with the customer to identify all the cameras, go through the implementation process, and then we start earning the revenue from the software. The software is priced on a per camera basis. So it's very exciting from a growth perspective because most of the customers that we have are adding cameras every single year to their surveillance networks. Uh, plus, we don't have to wait for a new installation. We can plug into existing video management systems or existing installations to pick up those cameras and start making them report in real time for our customers. Um, next slide, please. So at the moment, we have 27 customers around the world. As I mentioned, the best penetration has been into universities and retail space, uh, but we're also penetrating commercial buildings such as the new Woodside building here in Perth. Uh, and law enforcement's a growing space for us. It's an area where uh, governments have more budget than um, commercial currently, uh, and they're looking to spend that budget in uh, incentives. In fact, there was just an announcement from the West Australian government today that there, there's some really interesting openings up for us in, in, the, um, in the commercial tender space. We partner with companies for our distribution channels. This includes people like Chubb uh, and um, Delco Security, which is one of the largest security value-added resellers in Canada. Uh, and we have a very positive client, for example, Mount Royal University in, in Canada, 
Uh, but University of California in San Diego is another client of ours, and we've got them dotted around the world. Next slide, please. In terms of going to market, we have a B2B distribution channel, which includes enterprise sales through value-added resellers. All of the parties that you can see listed at the bottom, people like Prosegur, Securitas, G4S, these are companies with whom we have signed deals to distribute our product. But we also have very tight relationships with the technology vendors uh, and the companies that are producing the GPU processing power, such as NVIDIA, uh, to analyze this security footage and come up with the results uh, that we've displayed to our customers. Please to go to the next slide. Uh, we're very happy with our progress towards a recurring revenue model. So when the business started, most of our sales were enterprise-based um, software pricing and under enterprise pricing, you charge a high upfront fee and then have a trailing maintenance uh, fee, which is typically anything from 12 to 20% of your initial price. Uh, but we're moving over to a price per camera per day uh, and increasing our annual recurring revenue baseline. Uh, I can now move to the next slide, please. Uh, the board is a very experienced board. Uh, Mark Potts is the chairman. It was formerly head of um, CTO and head of corporate strategy at Hewlett Packard. Uh, and Justin Manolini is extremely well connected in the ASX listed space. Go to the next slide, please. There's the management team. I'll just call out Kevin Brown, who's a fantastic addition to the team pre-IPO, and he's been growing the business very rapidly and understanding customer requirements, which has been great. Uh, next slide, please. From a capital structure perspective, uh, we have currently on hand about 2.8 million in cash. Uh, we have a large proportion of our shares under escrow, so a small volume trading, uh, and we are trading at around 14 odd cents at the moment. Please go to the next slide. Oh, and that's the end of the presentation, so I'm very happy to take any questions. Thanks, David. A great presentation. A couple of questions. Um, you, you touched on the stickiness of clients that once the technology is embedded or the technology platform is embedded into their security system, um, it's difficult for them to turn it off from uh, an operational point of view because they get so used to how efficient the system is for them. Yes. Um, how, how, just explain that a little bit more in terms of why that stickiness uh, exists and, and why it's such a, a unique selling point for Isotana. Sure. So in the last two years, we've lost no customers at all, even through the COVID crisis. And the reason for that is when you install Isotana, you start to see events that you hadn't seen before and you realize the value of the product very rapidly because um, we are principally a risk mitigation product. Okay? We don't drive up revenues. We do actually, generally speaking, within the security space, increase the costs a little bit. But when we find an event, it can result in extraordinary outcomes for the security operations centers. So finding a stalker on camp campus and being able to arrest that person before he pulls the knife on an ex-girlfriend or, or finding somebody who's doing graffiti on um, very expensive uh, rolling stock for a public transport organization, it pays for itself many times over during the course of that process. And for the security staff, who are now able to, to you know, shine a light on their activities. And generally speaking, that you know, they've been backroom guys who have got you know, very, very little profile with the CEO. They can come forward and say, we found these things in real time. We stopped them before they became any bigger. Uh, this was picked up by Isotana. It's very hard for them to then turn around and say, I don't want budget for Isotana anymore, I'll switch that off. So what we tend to do is we get embodied into the operating procedures of, the, of these um, security uh, activities such that the customer, you know, they don't want to go backwards. It's a bit like, you know, you experience ADSL or you experience NDN, you don't want to go back to dial up because it's like a backwards looking system versus a real time system. And that's why we're so sticky with the customers. The challenge for us is of course the sales process because we talk about it like I've spoken to all of the investors today and people get it very rapidly, but until you've seen some actual events coming up, it's hard to get, to get super motivated about continuing to pay the bill. From an efficiency point of view, does it also mean, uh, from how I see it, does it also mean that you have less people sitting watching screens and you can have more people walking the beat around the school, the, the, yeah. Um, the shopping? Yeah, that's right. So we, we tend not to sell the, the efficiency uh, angle because we're generally selling to security managers who don't want to reduce their budget or reduce their staffing. 
However, there are companies that do remote monitoring, like Chubb and Prosegur, where they provide a service monitoring a string of external cameras coming into a central monitoring room. And there, the use case is very strong. And we're actually going through a tender process at the moment with a large organization, believe it or not, in Argentina, where they have more than 2,500 cameras coming into a single control room. And they actively monitor those cameras. And each operator is given about 60 cameras to watch. Now with Isotana, we reckon we can get that number up to almost 300 cameras per operator. So that's a revenue growth potential for them because they won't have to hire as many new operators and they can add a whole bunch more remote monitoring cameras. So that's a really interesting use case for us going forward. And I, you touched on the fact that facial recognition isn't something that you're focused on at the moment. How hard would it be to add that to the system? And is it something that as a pipeline opportunity you may look at? Yeah, look, there's a lot of people doing that. So that's a super competitive space. I'd rather be the guys who are at the front end saying, here's something unusual, now analyze it with facial recognition. There's, you know, there's probably 20 facial rec companies out there in the world. Everyone sells a slightly different offering. You know, some scrape the web, some rely on you to provide the database. It's just a space where I think I want to, I want to stick to our knitting where we're really, what we're really strong at and I want to sell for, on more cameras. So if you look at a facial recognition contract at a typical casino, they might sign up 20 or 30 cameras all around their perimeter where people are entering the casino. When I go into the casino, I'm trying to, trying to sell with 300 to 500 cameras because my system's going to pick up things that are in front of all different cameras that are interesting. And so it's, it's a very different play. However, when Isotana finds something, it's a great idea to daisy chain it into other analytics like facial recognition to say, okay, we've picked up some loitering. Is that somebody we really should be reacting to because they're on our database? Are you able to share a little bit about the sales process itself? What, what's the steps and, and where are the aha moments for clients? Yeah, so, so most of our leads come in from value-added resellers. So by value-added resellers, I'm talking about security integrators. These are the guys who are the experts in security um, network configuration. They work out where the cameras should be. They help with the installation. They help make sure that everything works comfortably together. They go back to their customers who are more forward thinking and say, oh, look, there's this cool new technology. So our typical sale process is first to prove that it works. And we do that by telling them to talk to our existing customers as a first point of contact. If they're not happy just with customer referrals, then we will do what's typically referred to in the industry as a proof of concept. Now, a proof of concept involves a very small device on which we can run about 50 cameras. And we'll run that proof of concept over a maximum of about six weeks. At the conclusion of the six weeks, the results from that are then shared with the customer and we analyze the types of events that we've picked up. And the aha moment happens at that stage where we say, okay, of the thousand odd events that Isotana reported, because you know, 1% is still quite a lot of events, there were 10 or 12 events that you had no idea had happened in front of your surveillance network, which are pretty interesting. And you probably should have known this was going on. And so that's where they go, okay, all right. So this is actually showing my own cameras, actual events happening in front of them, my use case has become much stronger. I'll go back to management and work through the, the budgeting process. But I have to say that a typical process for the sale process for us is anything from three months at the short end to 18 months at the long end uh, to, from first contact to closing a sale. But as you say, once you've got them, they stay very sticky. And the that's, that's, the, that's the plan. And we want, to, we want to get that recurring revenue number up and keep those sticky clients. And then we can just keep on growing off into the future. We do have plans to accelerate that growth. We're making our product much more deeply integrated with certain video management systems that are targeted at the high end of the customer segment. So not quite so disparate in our approach to the market being much more targeted because we know, you know, we know a lot more about the market the last few years than before. And the enthusiasm around AI has just been extraordinary in the last couple of years. Naturally, COVID has been a, a hit. Uh, but my team are, are highly motivated. They've all agreed to reduce their hours to four days a week so that we can conserve our cash and, uh, and close sales and stay, keep our head well above water into, well into next year. Matt, a great presentation, a proudly West Australian piece of technology out of Curtin University, yeah. doing amazing things globally. Thanks for your time. Thank you, David. Well, that brings to a close our Techno Invest Roadshow webinar for today. Thank you to each of you for joining in. The presenters were providing such great insights into their respective businesses and everyone associated with Techno Invest Roadshow who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to put on this virtual event, but also the in-person event, which we hope to bring to you again very soon. 
Remember, do your own research and where appropriate, seek professional advice prior to making investment decisions. Thanks everybody for your time. Have a great day.